Welcome everybody to the Working Class Movement Library in Salford and this week actually I am in the Working Class Movement Library so we really are welcoming you and uh, it's a joy to be here. Thanks very much everybody for joining us and uh, we welcome on St Patrick's Day, completely fortuitously, Ralph Darlington who is going to talk to us about British Labour Movement solidarity in the 1913 to 1914 Dublin lockout. Over to you Ralph. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, how's that? Everybody see that? Um, okay, well, um, happy St. Valentine's, everybody. Uh, what a, a day to do this talk. Um, let me start off by saying that the Dublin lockout uh, was really obviously the most important industrial struggle in Irish history. Um, 25,000 workers are locked out of their place of employment by over 400 uh, employers for refusing to sign an undertaking not to be a member of Jim Larkin's Irish Transport and General Workers Union. And it clearly represents a concerted attempt to crush independent uh, trade union organisation within Dublin. And of course, in the past, the Irish Transport Workers Union's great strength had been working class solidarity, whereby workers who found themselves um, in dispute with a group of employers, having to confront then the strength of the whole union via sympathetic strike action, which was mobilised against them. And what the lockout did was effectively to counter this with working class solidarity now matched by employer solidarity and the union plunged into a, prolong a prolonged uh, battle of attrition to bleed away its uh, resources. And what we find is that with inspirational defiance, with courage, with tenacity, the Dublin workers, many of whom were casual labourers with the lowest wages, some of the worst living standards and housing conditions in Europe, uh, held out for nearly six months between August of 1913 and January of 1914, uh, in a battle of epic proportions before finally being driven back to work defeated. Now, it seems to me that whilst most accounts of the Dublin lockout consider it primarily as an, an event in Irish history, the fact is it was also one of the most important struggles in earlier 20th century British history, because of course it was influenced by, and indeed there was an integral part of the great labour unrest or the great Labour and vault, a revolt that swept Britain in the years between 1910 to 1914 and therefore had tremendous repercussions in Britain as well as in Ireland. Whilst the embattled Irish Transport Workers Union was staunchly nationalist, Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom at this time and therefore the union regarded itself as part of the widespread movement of working class insurgency that was challenging employers and governments and so on in both countries. And Larkin's explicit attempt to spread the dispute into the heart of the British Labour movement via the appeal for sympathetic industrial action in support of their Dublin counterparts served to underline this, these sort of ramifications. If the victory for the Dublin workers uh, might have shaken the resolve of employers throughout Britain, then the defeat of the Dublin workers was only to give them encouragement. Now, what I want to suggest is that, you know, remarkably, there's been fairly um, little detailed attention been given to the nature and the extent and the dynamics of the solidar solidarity campaign that was generated inside the British uh, Labour movement. I mean, on a scale which I think the only thing, you know, comparable uh, in our lifetime would be the 1984-5 uh, minor strike, for those of you that can re remember that. And the reasons why this solidarity was such forthcoming and so on and its implications I don't think have ad adequately been addressed and therefore you know this is the logic behind uh, uh, this presentation and obviously I want to build on the work of other uh, historians and try to uh, push the analysis somewhat uh, in new directions based on the evidence which I think I've begun to uncover and really you know in essence what I want to suggest is it was the solidarity of the British Labour movement that clearly allowed the Dublin workers to survive for so long as they did. But a crucial contributory factor explaining why they went down to defeat, apart from, of course, the fierce opposition of employers and government and 
uh, police and so on and so forth, um, was the refusal of the TUC General Council and the TUC leadership, if you like, not the General Council, the, the, the TUC leadership as such, uh, to mobilise the sympathetic industrial action which Larkin had uh, requested. And I want to suggest that such a uh, a sympathy action in the context of the labour unrest that was taking place was not a completely unfeasible realistic prospect, even though whether it, if it had have been uh, uh, brought into being would necessarily have ensured a different outcome to the dispute. Of course, we can't, we can't know that. Okay, well, um, let me start off by looking at the extent of the solidarity that was generated for the British labour movement. And this, of course, was expressed in a whole number of ways. I mean, to begin with, um, there was the sheer level of financial assistance, which was generated by the TUC and by a whole number of individual unions, um, which allowed the Irish Transport Workers Union to continue to fight over the long months of the lockout. I mean, according to one estimate, the British Labour movement raised around £150,000, which in today's money would be worth about £11 million. And most of this came either from the TUC or its affiliated unions like the Miners Federation, the Amalgamated Society of Engineers, the Sheet Metal Workers Union and so on and so forth. Um, numerous local trade union branches and trades councils donated uh, 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 large sums. The, here in uh, the Manchester and Salford Trades Council, for example, contributed a, a, you know, a hefty sum. And there were, of course, also generous financial donations made by various strands within the, uh, 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 within the sort of political left inside the Labour movement. Every, everybody from the Independent Labour Party to the radical left groups, uh, organisations to the Daily Herald and so on, all raised substantial sums of money. And in addition, of course, money was raised at more generalised solidarity meetings by street collections and so on and so forth. There were also numerous specially chartered food ships, uh, notably the SS Hare, which is on the, the picture in front of you there, uh, that were sent to the Dublin strikers in very public displays of support organised under the auspices of the TUC. And these ships contained literally thousands of packages of food with crates of jam, of tea, butter, margarine, groceries and so on. Um, in addition, the enthusiastic response to solidarity appeals uh, uh, for the Dublin workers, I think, was evidenced by the huge attendance at many, many rallies that were held across the country for a number of weeks, many of which Larkin himself uh, addressed as part of a fiery cross propaganda campaign uh, that, that were organised by an amalgam of the, of the, of the left uh, uh, groups. Uh, for example, in Manchester, um, there was the famous meeting on the 16th of November in the 1913 in the Free Trade Hall. Um, this is a photograph taken in the Clarion Club, uh, which was on Oldham Street in Manchester, uh, just a, a few hours before the, uh, uh, the rally, and they then walked down to the Free Trade Hall. And in the photo, you'll see uh, Ben Tillett, the leader of the London Dockers and Dockers Strikes, uh, Jim Larkin himself, of course. And then on the far right, you'll see uh, relaxing in his chair there, James Connolly, who had returned from a, a tour of America and uh, had now become Deputy General Secretary of the Irish Transport Workers Union. Um, here's a solidarity meeting at which there are 4,000 people in the rally, but up to 20,000 people were left outside, unable to thronging the streets, unable to get in. And there were huge meetings everywhere else. In London, the Albert Hall, the Royal Albert Hall, uh, was filled to capacity on two occasions with 10,000 people, again with thousands of people unable to get tickets uh, for entry. Other meetings in Sheffield, 2,000, in Bristol, 4,000, in Leicester, 3,000, Edinburgh, 7,000. Uh, Glasgow, 4,000, as well as many numerous other towns and cities around the country. Beyond this, Larkin's arrest and his imprisonment for seditious libel also provide, provoked widespread protests and rallies and meetings and so on, uh, sufficient actually to force the Liberal government to release him early. Uh, one of the most famous of these events was the uh, uh, rally which took place in the Albert Hall, uh, packed to capacity. This was one which was addressed by uh, uh, um, a, a variety of speakers, again, Jim Larkin, uh, James Connolly, 
there was uh, Dora Montefiore, uh, there was, uh, uh, and, and notably, of course, there was Sylvia Pankhurst uh, from the Fed from the uh, from the uh, uh, the suffragettes, and of course, it was Sylvia's participation in this rally which was the last straw for her mother and her sister, uh, uh, and she was to be expelled from the organisation and then go on to found uh, the East London Federation of the of the of the suffragettes. But really, the extent of opposition uh, to the to the imprisonment of Larkin was sufficient, as I say, to force the government to release him er early. And it was this victory which helped further identify Larkin ever more closely with the Irish and the Irish struggle and the level of support for the Dublin workers here in Britain. And um, at the same time, there was the so-called Kitty scheme. This was devised by the socialist feminist Dora Montefiore uh, in association with a number of suffragettes around the Daily Herald newspaper, uh, which aimed at alleviating distress by sending some of the Dublin strikers children to stay with sympathetic families in England for the duration of the uh, dispute. And the scheme, of course, was modelled on the successful children's holiday, which had been organised by uh, the industrial workers of the world, or the wobblies as they were known, in America uh, during 1912 Lawrence textile strike. Uh, alas, in Ireland, the plan was to be short-circuited in the face of a full-blown opposition mounted by uh, the Catholic Church. But most significantly, I think, in terms of the support, there were two bouts of unofficial sympathetic strike action taken by railway workers across the country for Dublin. Uh, the first occurred in late September uh, when there was the suspension of three workers at the Victoria Station in Liverpool who'd followed Larkin's appeal for the boycott of St Dublin uh, exports. And this prompted 3,000 other railwomen in the whole of the Northwest to take solidarity strike action with them and with Dublin. The strike then spread down the tracks uh, to 5,500 other railway workers in Birmingham, Crewe, Derby, Sheffield, Gloucester, Nottingham and Leeds and so on uh, in support of the, of the dispute. The second wave of unofficial uh, Roman strike action took place in early December. Um, this was when two uh, Aslef train drivers uh, uh, were employed by the Great Western Railway Company were sacked for refusing to uh, run trains with coal bound for Dublin. And again, uh, this provoked widespread strike action by a number of thousands of, uh, of not only train drivers, but also uh, uh, ordinary railmen, different grades, porters and, and uh, uh, station staff and so on uh, in their support and again for, uh, for Dublin. And there was also solidarity action by the groups of workers, by dockers in Liverpool. Uh, here in Salford, um, you know, interestingly, actually, uh, uh, dockers who were on strike over union recognition agreed to suspend their dispute and unload a Guinness stout consignment on the ship, the SS Hare, uh, which had just arrived from Dublin, uh, provided it also took back some of the food packages for the city's locked out workers. And the other uh, expression of the sheer extent and depth of the British Labour Movement solidarity for the Dublin dispute, I think was underlined by the unprecedented decision uh, made by the Parliamentary Committee of the TUC to call a special conference in December of 1913 to discuss the Dublin solidarity for the Dublin dispute. Now the TUC had already had its annual conference in September, but pressure from below, hundreds of union branches demanding further uh, support and so on, led the TUC to call what was an unprecedented event. This was the first time uh, in, in, in its history since it had been founded in Manchester in 1868 that a special conference was called in this fashion in, in, uh, to look at the, uh, the dispute. So in sum, the support that was generated in Britain for the Dublin strikers, I think, represented a potent symbol of international solidarity. Uh, James Connolly uh, become the you know Belfast organizer and then was involved obviously in the Dublin dispute. He praised the trade union rank and file of Britain uh, in this fashion, and I, I quote: "I say in all solemnity." and seriousness that in its attitude towards Dublin, the working class movement of Great Britain reached its highest point of grandeur, attained for a moment to a realization of that sublime unity to which the best of us must continually aspire. Okay, well, now I want to turn to the variety of factors that might explain the extent of this support. And here, you know, there are a variety of things. I mean, the, the, the extensive coverage 
of the Dublin dispute in the British press, and also indeed in cinema newsreels of the dispute, uh, notably the events of Bloody Sunday in Dublin, when police drew batons and bludgeoned uh, hundreds of workers, uh, many uh, uh, were injured and so on. Indeed, two uh, strikers had been shot dead the day before, clearly aroused public consciousness and support among workers who were made aware of the Dublin employer's aggressive tactics and the burden of the lockout on an already uh, poverty stricken, uh, 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 you know, dockers and their families and so on. Meanwhile, I think the support generated by the TUC and its affiliated unions for the dispute also clearly encouraged a widespread appreciation of the generalised threat to trade unionism and the right to organise that was uh, uh, at stake here. And this was, I think it's important to say, official trade union support that came not only from left-wing trade union leaders like Ben Tillett of the London Dockers, uh, or by Robert Williams, the uh, chairman of the, of the National Transport Workers Federation, but it also came from perhaps more moderate, if not right-wing figures, uh, such as James Seddon, who was chairman of the TC Parliamentary Committee, uh, Harry Gosling from the Transport Workers Federation, and so on, who actually accompanied the TUC food ships to uh, Dublin. Um, at the same time, Larkin's fiery cross propaganda campaign with his flamboyant personality, his or oratical, uh, you know, oratory and so on, clearly met with a very, very enthusiastic response. Um, Jack Murphy or JT Murphy, uh, the syndicalist Sheffield based engineering uh, 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 union activist who went on to become, of course, one of the leaders of the First World War shop stewards movement and then of the British Communist Party. Uh, organized, helped to organize a solidarity meeting in Sheffield, uh, uh, to which he heard uh, Larkin speak for the first time, and he recalled the impact. He says, six foot Jim Larkin, with his powerful, torrentially passionate eloquence, swept the audience off its feet. I had never heard an orator of this caliber before, not seen an audience so roused to demonstrative enthusiasm. Here was the fighting leader bearing in his person all the marks of battle who would storm hell itself. And even the Manchester Guardian, not particularly a friend of, uh, of, the, uh, of Larkin or the Transport Workers Union, uh, reported thus, even the most convinced and implacable opponent, if he is honest, must admit that he is a man to be reckoned with, must admit too that a personal influence so extraordinary must be backed by a cause or a principle that deeply moves his fellow countrymen. And you know, I think one could say that it's not, probably not inconsequential that many sympathizers with the Dublin dispute had strong family Irish connections. I think this is generally the case in Lancashire, particularly in places like Liverpool and in Manchester. Larkin, of course, uh, was himself from Liverpool. He'd worked for some time on the docks in the city and as an organiser for the Liverpool-based National Union of Dot Labourers and so on. And both Larkin and Connolly regularly visited uh, Liverpool. Um, uh, Larkin uh, came to Manchester in November of 1910 to attend the inaugural conference of Tom Mann's Industrial Syndicalist Education League and therefore was you know, intimately related with the syndicalist movement in this country. Um, another factor I think is important, the level of solidarity which had previously been displayed by the Irish Transport Workers Union also for to the British labour movement, I think also helps explain the extent of support which was subsequently generated around the Dublin lockout. I mean, you know, one needs to remember the Irish Transport Workers Union had responded to solidarity appeals from British unions and in doing so brought uh, to their attention, uh, 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 you know, the nature of Larkin's organisation, even before the lockout had taken place. And so, for example, during the 1911 National Seamen's Strike, the Irish Transport Workers Union had gone to the rescue of the National Union of Seamen, with every ship that put into the port of Liverpool being, was held up by Larkin's dockers until its crew joined the union, and the union rates of pay and conditions were agreed by the employers. Uh, likewise, during the 1911 National Railway strike, uh, which spilled over the Irish Sea and Roman took strike action there, the Irish Transport Workers Union acted really as the, the Roman Union's agent in Ireland, paying their strike pay, refusing to handle boycotted goods and so on. And here you can see that it's the 
broad context of the labor unrest uh, that had swept Britain in these years, unprecedented uh, a period of militancy, not just uh, dockers and railway workers and, and uh, uh, transport workers, but miners, indeed 4,600 strikes that took place within this four or five year period, uh, leads to a dramatic you know, shift in the balance of class power within British society, the enormous increase in the levels of trade union membership and so on. It's clearly against this backlog of an assertive and growing trade union movement that the high level of solidarity of the Dublin dispute can be understood. And of course, one of the most striking features of this Labour militancy was its predominantly unofficial character. The fact that strikers often clash with their own full-time trade union officials. I mean, it was the perceived incorporation of trade union officials into collective bargaining and conciliation machinery, which meant that they were often unwilling to give support to their members uh, taking action uh, uh, that led to uh, for a wide layer of grassroots union members to look at the their union officials with some uh, 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 you know dis uh, 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 distance. Um, the Liberal government's uh, Board of Trade Chief Industrial Commissioner George Asquith uh, wrote about this and he reflected official leaders could not maintain their authority. Often there was more difference between the men and their leaders than between the latter and the employers. And according to JT Murphy's own account, uh, as he put it, to be again the officials was as much a part of the nature of the syndicalist minded workers of that time as to be again the government was part of the nature of an Irishman. And here, you know, within this, the I think within the labor unrest is the notion of the sympathetic strike, which became widespread during this period of groups of workers showing support for others that were in dispute, boycotting goods, taking sympathetic strike action, raising money and so on and so forth. This had become very widespread in the period leading up to the labor unrest, particularly, you know, when, in which railwomen and seamen and dockers and so on were involved. And I think is also crucial to the way in which uh, this leads to the, the groundwork for support for uh, uh, Dublin. And indeed, there's the sort of political context, the fact that there's a widespread challenge to the existing political system in Edwardian Britain in which the idea of looking towards the Labour Party, who was viewed as a sort of adjunct of the Liberal government, through the idea that change to advance Labour's concerns and uh, over paying conditions and so on might be advanced through from above through Parliament was really rejected in favour of a strategy of, of direct action from below through industrial militancy through class solidarity. And it's this, I think, as I say, which is crucial to, to uh, uh, the context in which the support for Dublin arises. And of course, within this, the ideological and political influence of the radical left, I think, is not uh, an unimportant feature. Uh, there's groups like the British Socialist Party, the Socialist Labour Party, the Plebs League, the Daily Herald newspaper. Uh, I've mentioned Tom Mann's Industrial Syndicalist Education League. There's the, group, the Unofficial Reform Committee in the South Wales Miners Federation. There are uh, the Amalgamation Committees, as they were known, grassroots group of, of activists and a whole number of unions who were campaigning to break away from the sectionless craft-based nature of British trade unionism to have more industrial forms uh, of organization of class solidarity. The fact that there were thousands of these activists in their various uh, ways, uh, I think is also crucial to seeing the, the role that they play in generating support for Dublin, for the solidarity, and also for criticizing the timidity of, of official trade union leaders who are less willing to provide uh, that support in the way that Larkin was to request, as we'll see. Um, well, let's now turn to Larkin's strategy uh, to win the dispute. And this, of course, was the call for sympathetic industrial action by the British Labour movement. And this is a call made in the light of the outright refusal of the Dublin employers to agree to any compromise settlement of the dispute. And the fact is they wanted to smash uh, uh, the Transport Workers Union and Larkinism more generally. And of course, the shipping employers began to import large numbers of strike breakers into Dublin. Notably, uh, they were brought in from uh, sea by from Britain. And therefore, the Tra Irish Transport Workers Union was confronted with a battle for its very existence. And it became clear that no financial or food assistance from the TUC and its unions, no matter how generous, was actually going to win the dispute. 
And here I think it's that Larkin recognised that it was going to be necessary to seek urgent solidarity industrial action in Britain. And therefore, uh, Larkin begins to appeal for this in the form of uh, blacking, as it was called then, or boycott to, uh, of all goods in transit to Dublin, uh, or so-called tainted goods uh, from Dublin that had been handled by imported scabs to break the uh, strike. And you see the way that in the face of the uh, lockout, the attempt by employers to deny the right to workers to organise and so on, then this call to boycott Dublin goods through sympathetic industrial action is viewed as the most effective way to try to break the solidarity of employers, force some of them to uh, make concessions and so on. And hence Larkin's crusade of meetings across Britain to appeal for this form of solidarity. Larkin himself uh, put it like this, we say all your money is useful, but money never won a strike. Money can't win a strike. Discipline, solidarity, knowledge of the position and the strength to carry out your will, these are the things. Now, of course, it's in the process of appealing for British Labour movement support um, that Larkin uh, notoriously and rather controversially castigated in a directly personalised fashion a number of individual trade union and Labour Party leaders for their failure to agree to call for sympathetic industrial action and to mobilise for that. And even after the TUC had agreed to call a special conference uh, in December, uh, uh, Larkin really continued to uh, warn uh, British uh, 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 Labour movement uh, to warn them about union leaders who, who we feared were attempting to try to foist a compromise settlement over the heads of the strikers, which was going to be inimical to their uh, trade union principles. As Larkin put it, tell your leaders that they are not there as apologists for the shortcomings of the capitalist system, that they're not there to assist the employers in helping defeat any action of workers striving to live, nor to act as a brake on the wheel of progress. And, you know, Larkin was very personal in this. He, he referred to Jimmy Thomas here on the right hand side of the National Union of Railmen as a double eyed traitor to his class. Uh, Havelock Wilson, the leader of the National Seamen's Union, was accused of actively assisting the Employers Shipping Federation in facilitating uh, strike breakers getting into uh, Dublin. And of course, this was a biting critique, caustic critique, which was widely condemned by the TUC and a number of trade union officials at the time. And indeed, it's actually been uh, uh, condemned by a number of, 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 uh, of Labour historians who've argued that it was gratuitous, that it needlessly uh, antagonised union officials, it provided ammunition to his enemies. Um, some people have argued, I mean, for example, uh, Emmett O'Connor has argued that uh, not only did it bite the hand that was feeding them, that really you can explain it in terms of Larkin's uh, uh, personality, that it, it, you know, is psych psychologically, if you like, is a sort of personality dysfunction or a sort of egotistic uh, form of, of behaviour. Now, I'm going to beg to differ, uh, to disagree with this, and to argue that I think you have to bear in mind that Larkin's uh, attacks primarily ref reflected his own direct personal experience as well as, as we'll see a bit later, a general embrace of the, of the, the uh, uh, syndicalist analysis of the limitations of trade union officialdom as really being synonymous with compromise and betrayal and defeat. Um, Larkin, if I could remind you, you know, was a full-time organiser for the Liverpool-based National Union of Dot Labourers. He'd organised a whole number of ports in Ireland in 1907 and 1908, 1908 through successful militant strikes and so on of carters and dockers. But it was Mar Larkin's militant approach which had brought him into conflict with the moderate leadership of the General Secretary James Sexton and his subsequent suspension from the union, which it was what led to the formation of the Irish Transport Workers Union in December of 1908. In other words, such experience led him to be under no illusion that Sexton would be prepared uh, to offer Dublin workers sympathetic industrial action unless he was forced to do so by pressure from his own union members. Moreover, Larkin was well aware during the lockout of the way that Jimmy Thomas of the National Union of Railmen had not only refused to support the unofficial bouts of sympathetic strike action which had taken place by his members, but actually instructed them to go back to work. In other words, 
From Larkin's perspective, Thomas, Sexton, Wilson and the others were effectively betraying the Dublin workers. And uh, his caustic remarks, you know, were not uh, notwithstanding. And therefore he felt that as he observed the labor unrest, you see one group of workers after another going to, into, into action, but often come into confrontation with their own officials. And therefore it's in this context, it seems to me, Larkin takes the view that um, why should trade union officials who'd often uh, acted as a break, if not betrayed their own members, behave any better when it came to supporting the members of a different union and an Irish union uh, to boot. And as we'll see there for Larkin's appeal for sympathetic industrial action uh, is made towards the grassroots of the union movement to the rank and file uh, on the expectation that the officials are likely not to be uh, sympathetic to this. Now, um, this raises the question as to whether there was any realistic prospect of this type of strategy being successful. And here, you know, uh, Padraig Yates has argued that really, you know, this was idealistic, that it doesn't take into account the underlying reality and so on. And again, I'm going to differ with this analysis. Um, first of all, let's look at the potential for this. Um, it's true, of course, that the number of workers on strike in the year of 1913 was less than it had been for the pre two previous years. But actually, the number of strikes was far higher than was the case. And you see the way in which in a whole number of industries, particularly in the railway industry, there are continuing uh, uh, grievances leading to unofficial uh, localised forms of strike activity uh, across the railways with workers concerned about their immediate terms and conditions of employment, the lack of official union recognition and so on. And you see the way that, for example, uh, the syndicalist railwoman newspaper and the group around it, can, it plays a role within this. And therefore, when it comes to the Dublin lockout and following Larkin's imprisonment, uh, it's interesting that 300 National Union of Railmen branches, representing about 85,000 members, pass a vote of no confidence in their leaders for tolerating what they call blacklegging. And they call for a national strike in solidarity with the Dublin dispute. And in the process, you see, I think, the possibility of linking the Roman's own outstanding grievances with the growing demands for solidarity with the Dublin dispute. Indeed, the Daily Herald newspaper at the time uh, interviewed one of the members of the National Union of Roman's London District Council, and he said, I have never seen enthusiasm as there is among our men in the London branches. They are ready for anything in the way of sympathetic action. Um, I think also there was a considerable amount of willingness to take sympathetic industrial action by dockers in different parts of the country who already had their own uh, forms of industrial militancy in the two years before. Uh, a leading London docks uh, uh, union official was reported as saying this, in all my experience, I have never known a time when there has been manifested such a desire to help any union in dispute as there is among dockers both in London and the provincial ports towards their Dublin comrades. We have had to rearrange the whole of our paid officials in London, placing them in certain centres with the express purpose of preventing any disorganised move. It has been with the greatest trouble and some of us have received rather strong words that we have so far been able to hold the men in check. Likewise, other unions show a willingness to take sympathetic action of an industrial kind for Dublin. At the annual conference of the Miners Federation, uh, delegates support a proposal uh, for all transport unions to uh, uh, for a coordinated strike in support of the Dublin dispute. And the TUC's own decision to call it special conference, as I suggested, was very much a reflection of the uh, hundreds of, of union branches who were sending resolutions demanding more uh, a more of a down tools policy that was taking, in, indicating the sort of, you know, graphically indicating the, the extent of the solidarity pressure that was building up. I mentioned also the idea of the sympathetic strike which had become very common in the British Labour movement at this time and you see it encapsulated in graphic relief by the, the, the Liverpool 1911 general transport strike literally one group of workers taking action with another all of them refusing to go back on until every, everyone's deal is settled and so on uh, showing really the appeal 
not only for industrial solidarity, but also in uh, uh, industrial unionism, because of course the clamor for uh, industrial union forms of organization, I think is also important and it leads to progress of the negotiations towards a so-called triple alliance between the leaders of the miners, railway and transport workers uh, with, uh, uh, with a view to coordinating that action so that in the event of any one of them being involved in dispute, the other unions can mobilize in their, in their uh, support. So in some, what I'm suggesting on one side of the uh, sheet is that against the backlog of, of the labor unrest and the continuing considerable unrest in a number of industries, um, there was clearly some potential for the call for sympathetic industrial action over the Dublin lockout to have been put into practice. Having said that, clearly there were also considerable obstacles. Now, one obstacle I think is that there, although there was a lot of strike action in Britain at the time, there was no national strike action in 1913 in the way that there had been the pre two previous years. Um, uh, the London uh, uh, dock strike of early 1912 had gone down to defeat and that was an important setback. There was clearly a problem in the sense that although there were a very wide layer of trade union activists and militants willing to organise for the type of action that Larkin wanted inside the trade unions, actually they were a minority within the labour movement as a whole and they didn't have the confidence to be able to put that into practice without some official union uh, support. The problem here, as we've said, is that trade union leaders by and large, not exclusively, uh, were emphatically imposed to the idea of this being taken. I mean, many of them were already uh, un, un, at ill at ease with union militancy on behalf of their own members because they feared this threatened the collective bargaining conciliation machinery they had already established. It undermined the possibility of union recognition deals and so on. And as a consequence of this, you see the way that uh, trade union uh, uh, leaders responded. I mentioned the railways. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy Thomas, um, who uh, faced with the first wave of unofficial strike action, actually directly intervened himself in, in union districts in the north, in the Midlands, in the west and Wales to assert his authority and to denounce sympathetic strike action as what he called ruinous. Uh, NUR officials went, were sent to Liverpool and to Birmingham to instruct their members to carry out their ordinary duties. And in the absence of official union support, the widespread sympathy or widespread sympathy action elsewhere, the strikers were eventually persuaded to return to work. Uh, likewise, in the second bout of an official strike action by a royal woman, um, Thomas effectively broke the strike by instructing NUR members to go back to work and to undermine the action that was taken by the uh, train drivers. And these are setbacks, particularly as that last one came literally two or three days before the TUC conference took place, which I think was extremely damaging and undermined the potential for the type of action that Larkin uh, uh, desired. Other union leaders match this. Um, James Sexton of the Dockers Union actually deployed officials in all the ports where it had uh, members to discourage uh, uh, unofficial walkouts. Havelock Wilson, the Siemens leader, uh, was absolutely fierce opponent of Larkinite methods. Even Robert Williams of the National Transport Workers Federation, a left-wing union leader, who'd actually been on the platform and spoke alongside Larkin at a number of the Fire Across propaganda campaign meetings, when it came to the call for industrial action in support of Dublin, uh, was unwilling to put his name to that. And of course, the Triple Alliance uh, a notion, the idea that it could be mobilised, uh, far from being mobilised in this fashion, was really left on the on the on the on the side. Um, now there are other problems I'll come to a bit later on in terms of the grassroots organisation, um, which made therefore uh, the possibility of translating this into practice rather more problematic. I want to say that you know, notwithstanding this, if the TUC conference had agreed to the call for sympathetic industrial action, it seems reasonable to me to assume, of course, this is unknowable, that it might potentially have transformed uh, the situation, at least giving confidence to that layer of activists who were arguing for this to be able to have been able to have put it in, into uh, practice. Um, well, this leads us to the TUC conference, um, which of course, 
um, ended up voting decisively against uh, uh, sympathetic industrial action. It, it voted by a majority of 11 to 1. And moreover, it, deplo it uh, deplored, it condemned the, uh, uh, the, what were claimed to be unfair attacks on British trade union officials, it expressed confidence in them and so on. And as a result of this TUC decision, and not only was the momentum for industrial action decisively crushed, but the Dublin workers were really left uh, to struggle on isolated, eventually going down to defeat. Uh, some weeks later, uh, in, a, in a sort of crushing uh, defeat. Hundreds of them were to fall victim to the blacklist. Uh, those who retained their jobs were to go back on humiliating terms and so on. Uh, James Connolly uh, put it like this. We asked for the isolation of the capitalists of Dublin and for answer, the leaders of the British labor movement proceeded calmly to isolate the working class of Dublin. And so we Irish workers must go down into hell bow our backs to the lash of the slave drive and eat the dust of defeat and betrayal. And more generally, this was a defeat which was also a blow to the British labour movement. And you see this underlined by the subsequent London building workers lockout of early, uh, uh, of early 1914. Now, you know, why did the TUC take this decision? Partly there are some procedural and structural factors which, you know, are not completely unimportant. I mean, there was no Irish union affiliated to the TUC. There are actually only two Irish delegates among the 560 present. Most of the officials at the TUC conference were full-time officials. They'd not been uh, mandated by members' meetings over the, what position to take over Dublin. Uh, uh, the National Transport F Workers' Federation, which was composed of over 20-odd unions, was not given credentials. Uh, the, the engineering workers union on the left was also not given credentials because they hadn't paid his union dues and so on and so forth. But those are not inconsequential, but they're not the most important reasons. I think there are others. But having said that, um, you know, some people, uh, Patrick Yates, who you know, wrote a marvellous book on the Dublin lockout, has argued that it would be a mistake to portray the TUC's decision as some sort of betrayal. Um, that, you know, this was not really the case. Now, it seems to me, you know, clearly they were concerned not only about unions disrupting their bargaining relations with employers and the threat that this would have if they were to agree to their members to take action. I think we also need to bear in mind the fact that they were also fearful of Larkinism. They were fearful of unleashing the type of militancy which their members were already clamouring for over uh, and had been for two or three years over their own immediate conditions and unleashing something which they would be unable to control. And of course, Larkinism, the idea of militant trade unionism, sympathetic strike action, respect for picket lines and so on and so forth, was something which for some of these officials at least was too much to, to bite on. And, there, and also, I think we need to draw on the um, sophisticated analysis of um, official trade unionism, which had been developed by uh, the syndicalists, uh, notably by the uh, uh, unofficial reform committee in the South Wales Miners Federation in their very famous pamphlet, The Miners Next Step. And you see the way in which, you know, when Larkin was very aware of this, uh, the way they draw attention to a conservative social stratum of union officials and the fundamental uh, diversion, if not antagonism of interests between officials and union members that arises within trade unions and the way in which officials can act as a break on workers' struggles. Um, and, you know, perhaps one very clear illustration of the dilemma which syndicalists drew attention to was to be uh, uh, displayed in, in sharp relief at the TUC conference when we consider the actions of uh, Ben Tiller. Ben Tiller was, of course, probably the most prominent left-wing union leader in Britain at the time. He also had appeared with Larkin on a whole number of platforms during the Fiery Cross campaign. But of course, it's, it's Tillett himself who strikes the fatal blow at the TUC conference, who actually proposes the motion to condemn Larkin's attacks on the leaders of the Labour movement and thereby to open the floodgates uh, of attacks which subsequently came uh, 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 elsewhere and so on. Now, um, having said that, I think there are clearly weaknesses. It's not, you can't just explain the TUC's decision in terms of the official drum. You've also need, got to look at the grassroots form of organisation. And the truth is, you know, and this is not way of criticism 
you know, from the benefit, it's obviously from the benefit of hindsight, but one has to rec recognize the context in which uh, people operated. Um, but there was insufficient, although there was widespread sympathy for Dublin and for the possibility even for, wide, uh, for sympathetic industrial action, I don't think there was the extent of confidence uh, there for people to take uh, that to, to take that type of action independently of officials themselves giving a call for that. And they weren't sufficiently well organised, uh, well, both within their own unions or in terms of intra-union organisation on a national level, uh, to attempt to coordinate this anyway. Uh, and a whole number of problems with this, the role of the radical left, uh, its views of the relationship between industrial and political militancy were blurred in, in certain respects. The syndicalists had a, a notion of uh, a, a very uh, decentralized, localized form of, uh, of structure, uh, uh, which didn't facilitate some, some the creation of some form of, of centralized alternative type of organizational leadership. It has to be said, Tom Mann, who was you know the most charismatic figure in terms of the movement and who bridged the gap between the official and the unofficial, uh, who might have been able to have played an important role in this. Tragically, he was out of the country. He was on a speaking tour in America for the vast bulk of the period. Um, and, you know, therefore, uh, you see problems here in the in the grassroots being able to, to do anything other, other than this. And here one needs to bear in mind that it's only with the First World War and the development of the, of the engineering uh, shop stewards and workers committee movement uh, and you know the, the famous pamphlet by J.T. Murphy, the workers committee, the, the syndicalists and the radical left more generally begin to see the need uh, to operate inside the unions, not only to support the rank and file against officials, but not merely assuming that they would be pushed out of, of step, but uh, where necessary to organise unofficially and independently of those officials, to put uh, uh, pressure on officials to take action where they can, but where they're not prepared to do this, to be prepared to organise unofficially. It's only with the strength of Shop Stewards organisation in the war years that this, I think, becomes something which is apparent, but and which was not the context uh, in 1913. So in conclusion, um, Padraig Yates has uh, sort of argued that, of course, the Dublin you know, lockout was a tragedy, but he argues that it was almost an inevitable tra tragedy. And I'm really wanting to suggest that that wasn't really necessarily the case. Um, of course, it was, it was a devastating defeat. Uh, but it also stands as a vivid example of workers' courage, of their tenacity, uh, 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 of their defiance, combined with the inspiration, uh, uh, you know, of uh, the inspirational sort of leadership in the militant tactics that were adopted. And crucially, it was the solidarity of the British Labour movement that allowed the Dublin workers to survive for as long as they did. But the fact of the matter remains, it seems to me, that if the strikers' fighting endurance proved unable to overcome the united front, which was mounted by the Dublin employers, by the police and by the Catholic Church and so on, um, the, then the other crucial factor in the equation contributing to the defeat was undoubtedly the entrenched you know, refusal of the bulk of the official union leadership to call uh, the type of solidarity action which the Dublin workers uh, demanded and the limitations of the of the of the radical left and the sort of rank and file forms of organization to be able to overcome that uh, to be overcome that resistance so i'm going to stop it there thank you thank you very much indeed ralph and uh, your audience are smiling appreciatively and will probably give you some silent applause if uh, <laughs> now that they know they're back visible yes they're indeed Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, folks, uh, I, I hope that you'll want to comment and ask questions. It would be really helpful if you could do that in the chat today, uh, due to the way that we're running the meeting. So if you've got thoughts to, to put in the chat, uh, I'd much appreciate it coming in that way. Thank you, folks. If you can uh, start to look at the chat, that that would also be great. So, uh, just just to while you're thinking of things, uh, uh, to say as you say, I'm as you may be able to see, I'm, I'm back in the library and we're hoping that the library will be reopening the week commencing the 12th of April. All sorts of things linked to what Ralph's been talking about for you to come and investigate all manner of things about Jim Larkin, about all the, the uh, Manchester Sovereign Trades Council, uh, the, well, 
oh man, everything that, that is mentioned, that you will find a cornucopia of resources here. Uh, you will even be able to look at the boards of our Dublin Lockout Centenary Exhibition. If you ask us nicely, we'll get those out for you. So uh, we would do hope that you will want, if you're near to us, to, to book an appointment, which we hope will be possible from mid-April onwards. So just drop us an email, info at wcml.org.uk, uh, if you want to make an appointment. Okay, let me see if I can find the chat. Right, uh, from Kevin. Ralph mentioned the role of the Shipping Federation in mobilising assistance for the Dublin bosses. This included importing strike breakers, notably from Liverpool and the North West. How did they achieve this, given the immense solidarity and support from the organised working class, as outlined in the presentation? Um, I think that's an absolutely brilliant question, Kevin. Thanks for that. And I, to be honest, I don't know the answer. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, they certainly did manage to bring cabs in uh, from the northwest, and as you say, from Liverpool and from Manchester, in fact. And the ships will would have gone from Liverpool. Um, how they managed to get away with that, whether they did that surreptitiously. Um, unbeknown to Liverpool dockers and so on, or whether Liverpool dockers took any action but it was unsuccessful, I honestly don't know. But I think it's a brilliant question, and um, it certainly, you know, would be interesting to, to to try and research that and find find out what happened there. But thanks, thanks for that. The the, the yes, the, there's always uh, more more uh, research to be done as a result of these talks, because people ask, ask such good questions. Uh, from Peter, the Irish Citizen Army was formed by James Connolly at this time. How did that influence the UK trade union movement? Um, I mean, again, you know, interesting question. I mean, the the Irish Citizen Army uh, was really a sort of brainchild, of course, of James Connolly. And it came about uh, during the course of the lockout, following uh, the Bloody Sunday events and the importation of, uh, of scabs. Um, as a defensive measure, I mean, you know, the, the problem was that they locked out workers, the pickets, uh, the mass, the attempt to have mass picketing in Dublin to prevent the scabs coming into the ports and so on, was thwarted by the sheer ferocity of violence which had been displayed by the police and the and the existence of the military in the area. And, um, you know, it, the inability to be able to mobilise the numbers that were going to be necessary to, to, to prevent that action um, meant that I think Larkin and Connolly were looking for, you know, then we need to look to some other tactics as could that might uh, secure the sort of support that we need. Now, Larkin's strategy, of course, was to become the dominant one. The, you know, I'm not saying there was a division between them. I mean, I think they both, it was a common thing, but I mean, the emphasis on, uh, and the possibility of trying to win solidarity industrial action from trade unions in Britain, you know, became the, the key thing. But nonetheless, Larkin's idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a militia, if you like, a workers militia, an armed uh, group of, of strikers who would try to defend uh, picket lines and strikers and so on was, was, uh, was what, how this was conceived. Um, of course, it's after the defeat of the lockout and in the battle for Irish independence that this then, you know, becomes part of the sort of armed struggle and the Irish uprising and so on. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that the, the Irish citizen army as such, uh, that model as such, as a sort of organised, you know, semi you know, semi, you know, workers militia, if you like, of a formal kind with training and, and so on. I don't think there's any evidence that that is replicated anywhere else in Britain during the labour unrest. But having said that, um, there are many, many examples. And, you know, those of you who've heard me speak on this period, you know, for previous uh, library events, will, you know, will, will recall that I've tried to give some feel for this of strikes that are extremely violent in which workers need to mobilise forms of self-defence, uh, which do involve violence of a defensive kind against scabs and against the police and against the military and so on. But I don't have not come across any form of, of sim, you know, similar type of more uh, militarised, you know, semi-militarised form of, uh, of army in the way that the, the Irish Citizen Army, you know, attempted to be. Thank you. From David, how much solidarity outside of the British Isles did the strike receive? Um, I think they did receive money. They received support from places like Australia and South Africa, 
New Zealand, America, and so on. Um, you know, and I think that was of significance, but obviously it's dwarfed by the amount of support which they receive, uh, they receive from Britain. So it's mainly a sort of financial and moral support rather than any other more direct practical uh, solidarity. Okay, and uh, Mary has asked uh, to know a bit more about the Burning Cross movement and, and specifically asked why one of the leaders shown in the Clavier Club was holding a tiny cross. Uh, sorry, where is that question? Um, uh, it just came to me. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, well, what was the Burning Cross movement? The Fiery uh, Cross. Um, sorry, so, the Fiery Cross. Yes, sure. the yes. Fiery yes. Cross. You know, I yeah. I can't remember now, and I should be able to, but I, it's so long ago now. I, I honestly can't remember where the 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 note that imagery came from. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. More for us to research. Always good. We can all go off from there and find out more. Mary, you've set us all the task. Thank you. Uh, from Declan, you mentioned that James Connolly was for a time Belfast organizer of the union. Given what happened later in the six counties, what reaction to the lockout was there in the north of Ireland? Um, I, I, you know, again, I don't really know. Uh, I, you know, my familiarity with the Irish Labour movement is on a is is much less closer than uh, with Britain, and so I really don't know. Um, I mean, I think you know, other than to say, of course, the defeat of the lockout is quite interesting because. Um, you know, what I found in the period of the Labour unrest more generally in Britain is that you can have significant defeats um you know and the dublin lockout was not a separate defeat dublin was very much part of britain uh, and that period and as i mentioned you can have the defeat of the london building workers but it doesn't actually derail um the whole momentum of the strike militancy of the period there's no evidence that you know there's widespread sort of inability of other groups of workers to take action or people are put off the idea of that and I found that elsewhere now I think interestingly what happens in in Ireland is that although the, Dub the Dublin lockout is a defeat and to be honest you know in case there was any sort of equivocation on this and sometimes you know uh, uh, you know you get different interpretations it was a decisive defeat um, actually it doesn't derail uh for the over the longer period the movement of labor of labor organization of trade union organization in fact you know emma o'connor's research on uh, on trade union organization in ireland in the period leading up to you know uh, to the to the civil war and so on shows actually that you you see a continuing rise of of working class organization of strike activity of syndicalist influence movements uh, and so on and so forth so although initially I think the Dublin lockout no doubt in a place like Dublin would have would have had a, a you know a detrimental effect on the notions I mean in Dublin of course uh, there'd been the famous strike in 1907 and on the Dublin on the Belfast uh, sorry in Belfast there'd been the famous strike in 1907 of the Belfast docks and Carters and so on uh, no doubt it would have had a general you know there would have been a spillover effect initially what you see is that during the period of from about 1918 1919 and so on uh, uh, uh sorry from about 1917 actually the, the workers movement in ireland picks up and you see an enormous wave of strike militancy uh, take place crescending around 1921 19, uh, 19, uh, 22. so um it's interesting the way that sometimes you know defeats don't necessarily uh, completely undermined undermine the potential of a movement. I mean, if you compare that with, say, the defeat of the miners' strike in eighty four five, which I think clearly, you know, had an actually calamitous effect on union organisation and and the you know un the, the propensity of workers to feel confident uh, to be able to take action. Then really, I don't think the Dublin lockout was it was not to have anything like that effect in Ireland uh, nor in Britain. Stuart's rather plaintive questions, sort of, you, you tack, well, you've, you've tackled it with what you've just said, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway to see if, if there's anything else you want to add. Why did this example of class solidarity and opposition to the capitalist system within the country seem to be swept away at the outbreak of the war in 1914? I mean, you know, the problem here is that um, the, um, on the one hand, you have most of the organized 
uh, labor movement, organ you know, institutional structures and sort of leaders um, pledging opposition to the looming prospect of a world war uh, being made for a number of years, actually, leading up to, to August of 1914. Um, you know, the Labour Party, the trade unions, the socialist left, um, international socialist conferences being organised, uh, at which, um, you know, the large organisations, you know, I'm sure people are familiar with this in Germany and France and so on, the social democrat, the socialist parties pledging themselves, even to the notion of the idea of an international general strike to prevent the possibility of, of their respective countries going to war. And alas, what happens, of course, is a complete and utter collapse of all of that as mass numbers of, of uh, workers in all of these respective countries um, fall to the, uh, uh, you know, to the nationalist drum uh, and clamour to join up. And within this, I think what happens is that those leaders, for example, of the Labour Party, and of the trade unions um, who previously, uh, you know, articulated and, and, you know, there are sort of rallies and sort of uh, events, Trafalgar Square uh, events, just two or three months before the outbreak of war, where these sort of pledges are made, all of that collapses overnight. And the TUC uh, turn around and pledge themselves to a no strike policy for the duration of the war. The Labour Party, apart from, you know, one or two honourable uh, exceptions, uh, of people who oppose it uh, uh, does likewise, and you know, you know, one should bear in mind. Of course, there were large numbers of conscientious objectors. There were people who were completely unhappy uh, and opposed to this. But I think the sheer, uh, uh, the nationalist sort of uh, uh, perceived threat of Germany uh, was to completely, you know, pull the rug from under the feet of the trade union militancy that had taken place. However, you know, and I, I, this is important to add, is that this didn't mean that the class struggle had completely gone out of the window. Um, there's a suspension, if you like. I mean, workers are willing to go to war and to join up and, and, and to uh, um, fight for what they perceive as being their country, but that only lasts for a sh fairly short period of time because by about 1915, uh, by certainly by 1916, even more by 1917, you see uh, the emergence of, a, of different uh, levels of strike activity taking place, notwithstanding the fact that we're, we're still in the war, that strikes are all illegal, that many of these strikes take place unofficially. And as more and more evidence becomes apparent of the horror and the slaughter on the front, um, coincide with the sort of <clears throat> uh, way in which many groups of workers feel that their terms and conditions of employment are being eroded uh, by the war effort, you see an increase in this forms of activity. And of course, it's primarily, although not exclusively, in the engineering industry, <clears throat> where some of the best organised workers in the munitions industry, which of course at the very centre of the war, Britain's war effort, in terms of providing the guns for the front and so on, where this trade union form of opposition and rank and file militancy begins to re-emerge. So, it, you know, it's true. There's an, it, it's a horrific collapse uh, in uh, 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 the outset. So that you look at the strike figures from up until, from January up until August of 1914, they continue to be quite high. And then after August, they really begin to drop, not completely by the way, but they, can, they drop completely down. But by 1915, 16, they begin to arise again until you, you have a re-emergence. So it's almost as if the class struggle is placed, is not forgotten. It's not that solidarity, it's not that class notions are somehow thrown out of the window completely by accepting the idea of, of, of you know, the, the war effort, uh, if you like, they're put on the shelf and then pulled back uh, in a greater, to a greater or lesser degree um, as, as, time, as time moves on. Thank you. I, look, we have what, maybe one last question. I'll, I say that because if you've, you're burning desire to ask a question, now is the moment to stick it into the chat box, please. Um, as it stands, this is our last one. What were the terms on which the strike was settled? Well, the, the terms were <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the <coughs> one of the things which Larkin had done, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> the, what the Irish Transport 
uh, and General Workers Union had successfully done in the lead up to the lockout was, you know, and this is the irony, I mean, Dublin was a uh, impoverished, city. it wasn't a particularly industrial city, um, it was mainly based around, the tr around transport and the docks and so on, but the type of a, a, a militant approach which Larkin's Union had adopted of militant strikes, of using sympathy action to force uh, employers to concede by by pulling in other union members by respect to picket lines and so on had actually been extremely successful so that by the time the lockout came around Larkin was able to claim with some justice actually that Dublin was the best organized city in the world you know now while that might have been a little bit of hyperbole compared with many other cities in Britain, for example, it clearly looked that way. The union had gone from about 3,000 members from the year when it was set up um, to about 30,000 members by 1913. And it was formidably well organised. Um, and therefore, when um, the employers counterattacked, the key hook on which they were concerned was to force workers to renounce their membership of the Irish Transport Workers Union. That was the key demand. And um, the key employer involved was able to eventually win the support of 400 other employers. By the way, not all of the workers who were locked out or who came out on strike were members of Larkin's Union. There were, I think, about 26 other unions that were involved. Um, but the Lar that Larkin's mm -hmm. Union should not be allowed to be organised within that workplace. Uh, and to have that sort of power. This was, to, in other words, to deny workers the right to be organised, to be to have the independence to be able to be a member of the union. So that was the the, the sticking point. And the truth of the matter is, is that the the terms on which they were forced to go back to work was to accept that, was to renounce the union's button. Uh, and even where they were, many of them prepared to do that in in defeat. Uh, having been out on strike for six months or whatever, many of them were not taken back because they were perceived as being militants and activists and so on. And so they were, were sacked and victimised as a consequence of that. Um, and they went back on open terms, whereby the union agreements which had been forged previously in a number of companies uh, were now no, no longer held because the union was no longer there to 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 you know the employer felt no obligation to maintain them so this was you know this was the consequence of that but as I say this was to be you know pretty well reversed within a relatively short period of time by at least by 1917 you begin to see uh, the you know the move of, of Irish workers on a, on a, a really new uh, a, a scale of, of militancy which begins to really you know to shift this back. That sounds like your next talk, Ralph. <laughs> We're very grateful to you for joining us once again and for sharing your great expertise with us. Thanks, folks, for your good questions and also for um, being part of an unexpected experiment while we, we test the Wi-Fi out at the library. It seems to have worked okay. So you're all still with us, which is great. So we're, we're particularly glad to know that that has worked. Uh, so we will be back with you at the same time next week. That's our last talk before Easter, and we will have Lauren Murphy, who is going to come and talk to us about the Bradford Pit project that she's been involved with uh, for some years now, and there is uh, now a memorial, uh, which uh, which is shortly be launched in real life, but we will be getting a sneak preview of it. So uh, do join us again next week. Uh, once again, thanks very much to today's speaker and to all of you for participating. And I will uh, sign off as usual by saying, uh, in solidarity. Thank you very much for all from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye.